Welcome to the Tesla shareholder meeting. <laughs> I just want to start off by saying, hot damn, I love you guys. <laughs> we have the most awesome shareholder base. I mean, it's just incredible. Any public company, it's incredible. Wow. We've got a great sort of shareholder meeting here to recap the achievements of the, the company and tell you about where we're going. I think it's incredible. Not just opening a new chapter for Tesla, we're starting a new book. Okay. Those of you who have been following Tesla closely understand, like you get it, you know? So it, like, the important thing is you get it. I mean, it's <laughs> where things are going, I think is just gonna be absolutely mind blowing. We're obviously making great progress in uh, solving the sustainable energy problem uh, you know, with electric vehicles, with stationary storage, with uh, solar. And uh, I think in terms of the, the value of the company, autonomy is just such a mind blowing thing. Like I said, you guys understand, but I think most of the world does not yet understand. And, uh, you know, in, in talking to a lot of those sort of big institutional investors, when they're, when they're often in like New York and they don't drive cars, <laughs> so I'll be like, have you tried self-driving? You know, the, the version 12.3, and they're like, oh, no, okay, well, you should try it. That would be a good thing to do. And, and if you just plot the points on the curve of how well autonomy is progressing, and just believe the curve. It's headed towards unsupervised full self-driving very quickly at an exponential pace. <laughs> it's really as simple as that. And in fact, I'd invite you to just do it personally. Just say, okay, with each release, how many miles do you drive before you have to intervene? It's like literally that simple. With each release, you'll see it, there's a big improvement, big improvement, and it looks like an exponential. And it's very clear that that will actually go to the point where it is actually far safer than a person driving the car. And, and I have some insight into the next releases because for every release that's on the road, we, we kind of see what the next generation release is and a little bit about the release after that. So we have some insight into where it's going and it's really amazing. No question whatsoever that will far exceed uh, human safety. You know, I have mentioned this, but like sometimes it's like helpful to sort of reiterate and connect some of the dots because sometimes people wonder, well, how do you go from this big fleet to actually monetizing the fleet in an autonomous situation. It's actually a combination of like Airbnb and Uber to some degree. So like there'll be some cars that Tesla owns itself in kind of like an Uber fashion. But then for the fleet that is owned by our customers, it will be like an Airbnb thing. You can add or subtract your car to the fleet whenever you want. So you can say like, I'm going away for a week at just one tap on your Tesla app, your car gets added to the fleet and it just makes money for you while you're gone. So you can say, you, you can add it to the fleet for a few hours, for a few days, for a few weeks. Whenever you want it back, you can say, come back, and the car will come right back. And I'm highly confident that it will far exceed, like the revenue made by the owner of the car will far exceed the actual monthly payment. And then Tesla will obviously take a rev share on that, but most of the money will go to the, the owner of the car. And this is actually gonna work. This is what will happen. I'd mark my words, this is simply a matter of time. Now, admittedly, I'm a little optimistic sometimes. Uh, <laughs> You know, I'm, I, you know so I don't have complete lack of self-awareness. Uh, but if I wasn't optimistic, this wouldn't exist. This factory wouldn't exist, you know? <laughs> like when we were kids in school, my, my brother would tell me the, the wrong time for the bus so that I wouldn't miss the bus. <laughs> and then I'd be upset with him, like, why'd you tell me the bus was gonna come earlier than it was? And, and, and he's like, well, because otherwise you'd be late for the bus. <laughs> this is an actual thing that, that would happen. So I, I guess I've been sort of pathologically optimistic, you know, from birth. That's the reason this is, all this stuff is happening anyway. It's like, I gotta be somewhat pathologically optimistic. But I do deliver in the end. That's the important thing. I mentioned this before, but like, for ARK Invest, I'd, I'd recommend reading the ARK Invest analysis. That's the, there may be, you know, more accurate ones, but the most accurate sort of analysis of the potential of autonomy, the most accurate that, I, that I'm aware of is, is Kathy Wood's ARK Invest. And if I recall correctly, they predicted somewhere over a $5 trillion valuation for uh, Tesla just based on vehicle autonomy, not counting Optimus. Yeah. I agree with that. <laughs> I think just based on vehicle autonomy, we can, we can 10X, more than 10X the value of the company. I believe that's what will happen. Hey, I know it's just, what, what, what do you know? It's, it's, it's 4.20 p.m. <laughs> just notice that. I think that's actually, that's pretty accurate. It, it actually gets way crazier when you think about the, our, the Optimus robot, which is really a humanoid robot that is intended to, you know, be able to do anything you want it to do, 
to be you know, your companion. It, it can be at your house. It can sort of babysit your kids. It can teach them. Uh, it can be a teacher. It can do factory stuff. I, I think that the ultimate ratio of, say, how many super useful humanoid helper droids do you want? Like, who doesn't want a C-3PO? Yeah. But a C-3PO plus R2-D2 plus, you know, plus plus. It would be pretty awesome. I think everyone in the world is going to want one. Like, literally everyone. And, and then there will be, obviously, robots in industry making stuff. And I think the ratio of humanoid robots to humans will, will probably be at least two to one, something like that. One to one for sure, so, which means like somewhere on the order of 10 billion uh, humanoid robots, maybe 20 or 30. So then it's like, okay, well, let's say the build rate is, I, I think the build rate will be probably something ultimately like a billion a year, humanoid robots, like actually. And if Tesla just has a 10% share of that, and it might be a lot more than 10%, and there's, you know, who make like 100 million Optimus units a year. I just, I mean, for reference, the auto industry is roughly 100 million vehicles per year. Sort of similar ballpark, at least within an order of magnitude. And I think we could make one for a cost of maybe at really high scale of about $10,000. It's smaller, it'd be less expensive than a car. If you sold it for, sell for $20,000 or something, this is at large scale volume. Tesla would basically make about a trillion dollars of profit a year from that. If the price earnings multiple is, say, I don't know, 20 or 25, something like that, that would mean a $20 trillion market cap from Optimus alone, and, and probably five to 10 from autonomous vehicles. Like, I think it's actually conceivable, it's within the, within the realm of possibility uh, for Tesla to achieve a valuation 10 times that of the most valuable company today. So, so when I say this is like we're starting a new book, I mean, it's gonna be the best book. <laughs> Oh, oh, no, we need to make sure these robots are nice to us and, you know, that's very important. <laughs> so anyway, that, so with that, let me get into the presentation. Blah, 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 blah. I think it might be worth us ha just have putting a word limit on future shareholder Tesla uh, proposals. <laughs> <laughs> like, you, you can't have, like, a novel length, you know, it's kind of like, you can't have a whole novel as a, as a proposal. Anyway, as you can see, our impact is accelerating, we're starting to make a real noticeable dent in uh, carbon emissions. So we're, we're really making a lot of progress towards achieving our goal of sustainability. And one of the effects of autonomy is actually is going to be an even greater effect on carbon emissions because I suspect that we'll go from passenger cars having about 10 hours of usage per week, about an hour and a half per day, to probably a third of the hours in the week, maybe 50, 55 hours, which means the same car will, will be used five times more often. So you, you need a certain amount of resources to make the car, but it'll have five times the usage in my opinion, I think that's quite likely, uh, which will be an even more dramatic impact on carbon emissions. You know, we, we care a lot about sustainable manufacturing. Our factories are beautiful. Like you walk around the factory, it's actually, you know, contrary to these, like, what you read in the press, it's like a good vibe in the factory. Like, people are smiling and happy. It's like, <laughs> it's nice. <laughs> we actually do care a lot, it tells about doing the right thing. We're not going to be perfect, but we do care a lot about doing the right thing. So our vehicles are water efficient, energy efficient. You know, we try whenever possible to use renewables for powering the factory. And, uh, you know, we do our best to do the right thing. Our batteries are lasting a lot lo <laughs> longer. I get too many things in my hand. Anyway, the batteries are last lasting a lot longer, which is, which is good. Safety is good in the factory. We're improving the affordability of EVs. You know, Model Y is comparable to BMW X3, but its actual cost of ownership on a monthly basis is much lower. We were number one in EVs globally last year. Let's see, and congrats to the Tesla team on making six million vehicles all time. So. I mean, the Tesla fleet is really becoming very substantial. I mean, it's gonna be seven million vehicles by the end of this year, over seven million vehicles. Our, our factory in Fremont is currently the highest volume uh, auto, auto factory in North America, and, and we broke the prior production record from when it was new me. It's actually pretty wild. We have a giant car factory in the San Francisco Bay Area. It's not exactly the cheapest place to have a car factory. Um, it's like that in the Swiss Alps or something, you know. We still managed to make, uh, you know, great cars at high volume, and that's a testament to the, the great team we've got in Fremont. Uh, so congrats to the Fremont team. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people were saying the Cybertruck is like fake, it's never gonna come out. Now we're shipping a lot of Cybertrucks. We, we hit a, a weekly uh, record of 1,300. You know, I think that with the Cybertruck, it, it really is something special. Like, you know, people sometimes have, like, different opinions on the Cybertruck, but if you really want to know if something is, is cool, if it's, if it's a great product, like, show it to a kid, okay? <laughs> no filter, okay? The kid's got, like, no filter, like a five-year-old, six-year-old, something like that, and, or th even three-year-old, and say, which car do you like? Cybertruck. 
<laughs> That's how you know. And um, it's, it's finally something that just looks like the future. It's, and it drives so well. I think it's our best product. And um, it's a lot of innovation. It's got a 48 volt uh, low voltage system. Finally, instead of 12 volts, uh, 800 volt drivetrain, the world's biggest castings. Uh, you know, it's bulletproof, all, all the cool things. Can, you know, out pull a F-350 diesel, which is a very impressive truck. You know, it, it can do a quarter mile faster than a Porsche 911 while towing a Porsche 911. <laughs> so, that's insane. If you think about it, like, how often do companies make products that move your heart, that are really special? It's, it's so rare, and I think this is one of them. And we launched the Upgraded 3, which is actually a fantastic car. I recommend trying it out. It's really a, a great car. And uh, it's only $216 after gas savings, like total cost of ownership. It's basically 200 and something dollars when compared to a gasoline car, a similar gasoline car. So it's really uh, a great deal and a fun car. And the performance, Model 3 performance is, you know, faster than Porsche 911. It's just a great, great car. <laughs> so, and of course, Model Y became the best-selling vehicle globally. And this, this is something that we predicted. You know, I think I said in like 2022, uh, it would, Model Y would be the biggest car in the world by dollar volume sales, and that 2023 it would be the biggest in uh, unit volume, and it was. And I, again, this year it will be the best-selling car on earth. And uh, so we've got the, the Tesla Semi. You know, we're, we're in low-volume production of the Tesla Semi, and um, just last week I approved the plans for volume production of the Tesla Semi. So, so we're going to make a, a lot of semi-trucks. So, yeah, it, it's something, I think it'll actually move the needle financially. It's not like, a, it's not a small, small thing. The thing about, like, uh, uh, commercial vehicles is that companies that use them are super objective. It's not like, I mean, obviously we're going to make it ha have cool style and be an awesome car, but for commercial vehicles, the companies that make the, the buying decisions, they, they just look at it and say, like, what are the numbers? Like, is this cost less to transport or cost more to transport than, than say, a diesel truck? And it, the thing is that the economics uh, are much better than, than a diesel truck. It's kind of basically a no-brainer. Um, if, if you're a transport company, you don't use an electric, the Tesla electric semi, you're just losing money. Why would you do that? <laughs> do you not like money? <laughs> okay. Uh, but if you do like money, then I recommend using the Tesla Semi. <laughs> so I think this is, this is really going to actually uh, sell at a scale that people will be surprised at and, and will actually move the needle financially and, and do a lot of good. Also for, for CO2 and, and, and sustainability, because uh, semis are driven all the time, actually ev even at, at much smaller numbers, they have a, a very big effect on total uh, carbon emissions solved. So, obviously, we've got some new products that we're working on under the covers, and uh, I think these, these are, I think these, these are going to be pretty special. So, you know, some of them, I, I think people at, maybe at first may think, oh, it's not going to be that amazing, but just wait. <laughs> it will be. So, uh, our supercharger network is continuing to grow. You know, rumors of the death of the supercharger are greatly exaggerated. We, we are, in fact, uh, continuing to grow the supercharge network significantly. In fact, this year, I think we'll put more, we'll deploy more superchargers this year that are actually working than the rest of industry combined. Just FYI. <laughs> now, we are going to be more careful about like the capital efficiency of where we deploy superchargers. But for sure, any place that has congestion, any sort of missing parts of the map that we're missing, we're going to put the superchargers there. Even for the remainder of the year, we, we expect to spend about half a billion dollars on, on supercharger deployment. So it's, it's very significant. And it'd be a well-spent half a billion. So this is, a, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot. This is actually not showing a bunch of new markets that will be uh, opening up later this year and next. So we're, we're obviously, want, we want Tesla to be worldwide. And there's still a lot of countries that we, you know, have zero to very few Teslas. And we obviously, we, we want Tesla everywhere. So uh, there are a lot of new markets that we're going to open up uh, later this year and next. We're also opening the supercharger to other companies. Our, our goal is to, to be helpful to other car companies. So any other car companies that are going electric, uh, we do want to we do want to be helpful to them with our supercharger network. So we're providing them with uh, adapters and enabling them to have access to the Tesla supercharging network uh, because we think it's better to do that than to create a walled garden that inhibits EV growth. And we're also innovating a lot in 
uh, battery production with the 4680 that's built uh, right here. It's a hard problem, you know. There are entire companies that just make battery cells. That's all they do. But we're making good progress. Like all, all the Cyber trucks that you see use the Tesla 4680 cell. We have a clear path to the 4680 being probably the most competitive cell from its from a manufacturing efficiency standpoint. It is a hard problem, I have to say. <laughs> There's, there's quite a lot of brain damage required to be good at cell manufacturing. It's like a brain damage high. But I think it does give Tesla resilience in the face of if, if there are changes in the, I don't know, geopolitical situation somehow. <laughs> it, like it's good to have some independence in cell manufacturing. And we're making steady progress. And we also have the, the cathode refinery, which you can see behind the, the, the main factory. So you can sort of see it in the picture there. Uh, that's the cathode refinery. And then we've got the lithium refinery uh, in South Texas. And so we're just making sure we've kind of got the pieces of the puzzle. Um, and if you were to look at sort of a video of how Tesla does, say, cathode and, and lithium refining and how the rest of industry does it, it's night and day. I mean, you can sort of eat off the floor uh, in, the, in the Tesla refinery, and I would not recommend doing so in the others. It, we're definitely going very, very vertical here. But I think this is a, it's a wise investment that will pay off more than people realize. I don't think this thing's working. <laughs> so this year, we're also on track to complete a massive number of energy deployments. So that is a gigantic increase in, in deployment uh, capability. We seem to be tracking to sort of a two to 300% year over year growth in energy storage deployment and stationary pack, giant. And the, the limiting factor really is being able to build more mega packs and build more power walls. So we're ramping up production of the Power Wall 3, which is really a game changer for at the personal level. Power Wall 3, it usually takes about uh, three iterations of any given technology to, to really, for it to be something where it's like, okay, now we're really hitting the sweet spot. So Power Wall 3 is like an epic product. The Mega Pack is also, I'd call it sort of iteration two of the Mega Pack is, is also an epic product. With the Mega Pack 3, which is, I don't know, probably a, a couple years away, we'll, we'll start actually absorbing more and more of the substation of the, of the sort of power electronics. Because I sort of think you want to get to the point with the Mega Pack where you can literally just take the high voltage power lines and plug them in. Just, there's no substation. Drop them down, and uh, drop it down, and plug it in. That, that's and now, now it works, which is like mind-blowing for the utility industry, by the way. Like, they're like, what? <laughs> that I think is, is actually gonna be a major. So this is uh, excellent work by the energy storage team. So. Uh, services and other uh, are also looking good, so we're actually now making money on the services and other stuff. This is a, kind of a big deal. Uh, yeah, and, and Tesla's obviously way more than a car company. We do a lot of software at Tesla. You know, about a very huge percentage of the, of the engineering we do is actually software engineering. So Tesla's, I'd say, as much a software company as it is a hardware company. This is a very big deal because car companies are not software companies. It matters a lot. So things like our auto of software for energy storage, all of the software that controls the cars, the mega packs, the, the power walls, or the solar, obviously for AI and and full self-driving are a big deal, insurance, service and collision. The Tesla also writes a lot of software internally. We call it like the Tesla operating system internally. That is head and shoulders above what any other uh, company has. I think probably better than any Fortune 500 company. It, the Tesla internal software is, is just way better. It's, yeah, just uh, far more than what people normally think of as a car company. And Tesla is also the, world, the, the leader in real world AI. There's really a um, big deal. Like Tesla is ahead of Google, Meta, you know, OpenAI, anyone on real world software actually look, taking in video and making decisions based on video. No one is even close. And it's getting better, I say, with each passing month, if not each passing week. And it's, it's also worth noting that Tesla is actually pretty good at chip design. The AI inference chip that was designed by Tesla that's in cars, sort of our hardware three AI inference, cars made in the, you know, over the past year have the hardware four. Um, we've just completed design on hardware five, which we're now calling AI five, because th there still actually is not a, a chip from NVIDIA or from, and I have a lot of respect for NVIDIA, from any company that we would prefer to put in our car that is better than what we have in the car. We started from scratch in chip design, just as we started from scratch in AI software, uh, and have the best real-world AI software and the, and the best AI inference chip in the world, from nothing. And the, the capability of the, the chips in the car is, is dramatic. Like, right now, uh, all the cars are actually training. We have hardware 4 run hardware 3 in emula emulation mode. 
We'll continue to make significant progress on Hardware 3, but later this year we'll actually bifurcate, continue working on Hardware 3, so on tra training on Hardware 3, uh, then do separate training on Hardware 4. That'll be the, the sort of training cluster that we're building at the south side of the Gigafactory. That'll be uh, dedicated Hardware 4 video and uh, inference. You know, so the Hardware 4 has cameras that have about four or five times better resolution, and depending on how you count the, the sort of Hardware 4, it's, it's about anywhere from three to eight times better than Hardware 3. So, but, but everything you're seeing thus far is just Hardware 3, and we still have a long way to go before we, get, we reach the limits of Hardware 3. So Hardware 3, I think, will we'll still we'll do amazing things, but, but Hardware 4, I think, will probably do about five times better. Then Hardware 5, which comes out in about 18 months or so, is 10 times more capable than Hardware 4. It, it's like, a, if you know, NVIDIA hardware, it's, it's sort of a, a B200 class computer. So what we'll just progressively do is improve how many nines of reliability the car gets. And, and then, of course, that will go into Optimus as well. So the same uh, chip will go into Hardware 4, will, will go into Optimus, is, is an Optimus. AI5, which we're calling switching from Hardware 5 to AI5, will be an Optimus and in, in all cars in, in about 18 months. And it's really just a, a staggering amount of compute. It's very power efficient compute. Because if you're in a mobile application like a humanoid robot or a car, you, you can't just be sucking down 10 kilowatts, you know, like you can in a data center. Um, so you, you've got to be very power efficient. So sort of hardware three and four are only a few hundred watts. Yeah, this is hard. <laughs> now hardware five will be able to go probably up to about seven or 800 watts, it, but it'll, it'll power fluctuate contingent upon the complexity of the scene that it is, that it is in. So if it is in a you know, parking lot stationary, it's like, you know, don't have to think very much, just like a person. Like if you're in a complicated traffic scenario, you've got to think a lot more than if you're just cruising along, you know, on an empty road. But something that I think is potentially interesting down the road is like at some point the Tesla fleet I think will probably be you know over 100 million vehicles. And if each vehicle has a kilowatt of efficient inference compute, I think there's a, a sort of an Amazon Web Services AWS type opportunity because if you've got 100 million vehicles with a kilowatt of efficient inference compute, you've got 100 gigawatts of compute. Like 100 gigawatts of compute is a lot, and it's distributed all over the world. So even so, when the car is not in autonomous mode, which I think probably is doing robo taxi work, maybe 50, 60 hours a week, but about 100 hours a week is probably stationary. So there's 100 hours of 100 gigawatts of inference compute, which I think we should use. Um, <laughs> why not? When people looked at Amazon, which started out obviously as an online bookseller, and it's on, has grown to be like this incredible place where you can buy anything and and then they, Amazon Web Services, like, well, they got all these computers that only really see peak usage sometimes. What are they going to do when it's not peak usage? Um, and sometimes the Amazon servers are down at like 10%. So that's when they said, well, let's do Amazon Web Services. And then Amazon Web Services became more valuable than the entire rest of Amazon. Anyway, I think there's, there's some kind of opportunity there that's pretty significant for, for Tesla down the road. You know, again, that's really, nobody's really factoring that in. But I think that, that actually will be quite significant. Uh, we also are no longer compute constrained uh, for training. And I, I check in with the team, is like, is there anything we could do to improve the pace of progress with respect to training and inference? And currently that is not the limiting factor. In fact, the, the limiting factor right now is that the amount of miles between interventions is uh, so long that it takes quite a while to figure out which version is better than the other version because none of them are requiring any inter interventions. <laughs> so it's like, you know, if you start getting to like thousands of miles between interventions or you're like 10,000 miles to get an intervention, then, well, the average person only drives about 10,000 miles in a year. Um, and if it's in an urban environment and the average speed is 20 miles an hour, so our professional test drivers get pretty bored, frankly, you know? They're like, okay, I drove all week and there was no intervention. Like, like the highlight of the week would be like, yes, an intervention, finally. <laughs> So, th so this is where uh, actually having giant fleet is extremely important because we can deploy a new FSD model and run it in shadow mode and see how well it performs. You know, compare how the human drives the car versus the, the new self-driving build and, and then analyze that delta in shadow mode like the shadow knows uh, or doesn't know as the case may be and, and then be able to assess uh, by getting billions of miles very quickly with the giant fleet. Like that basically, that, that data engine is incredibly helpful. Like I, I actually, it's not possible to solve the self-driving problem without having millions of vehicles on the road. So that's actually, is, is like figuring out clever ways to test how good the next build, FSD build is 
is, is actually the limiting factor right now. Uh, and then, of course, we, like I said, we're, we are building another training data center right here, uh, which will be dedicated to hardware four training. So we'll, we'll bifurcate hardware three and hardware four training later this year. We'll, we'll keep improving hardware three, but we're, we're going to uncork the full capability of hardware four as well. And I think, I think most people here have tried out version 12. We did say like unsu sort of unsupervised full self-driving full self driving would be version 12. So we, we are actually keeping the version arbitrarily at 12 and then like pulling a 12.4, 12.3, 12.4, 12.5. But it's actually really like version 13, version 14. But anyway, this is an arbitrary designation. 12.4 is actually like a whole different version than 12.3 and 12.5 is a whole different version than 12.4. You'll see really giant improvements. I think sometimes factor of 10 improvements uh, in between uh, successive versions. And then, as I mentioned, th the way it'll work for the existing fleet is you'll be able to add or subtract your car to the fleet as, as you'd like, and there will also be Tesla-owned cars. So it'll be a combination of like Uber plus Airbnb. It'll be pretty wild that, the, that there'll be a software update, and then the whole, the whole fleet suddenly becomes accessible. It's like suddenly you've got uh, 7 million, 10 million cars that can do autonomous driving, um, and instead of being used 10 hours a week, it can be used 50 or 60 hours a week. So. So it's, it's pretty wild to just you know be in Palo Alto with a bunch of cubes and then a humanoid robot just w walks past. Um, we've made a, a massive amount of progress with Optimus in a short period of time, from someone pretending to be a robot dancing in a suit uh, to a, a pretty hodgepodgey robot to a robot that is actually doing useful tasks in the factory today. Um, so we have two Optimus robots in our Fremont factory that are doing basically this task, which is t taking cells uh, off the end of the line and placing them in a shipping container. And um, we actually have quite a few of these cruising around our offices in, in Palo Alto. So there's, and, and I think we've got kind of like one major hardware revision, which should be done by end of this year or early next. And, and then we'll move into a limited production next year of Optimus. L limited production for use in our factories where we'll test out the product, kind of eat our own dog food or whatever the electronic equivalent of that is. But I, I think like next year, I mean, my prediction is next year we'll have over a, over a thousand, maybe a few thousand Optimus robots working at Tesla. So. And things are going to scale up very rapidly uh, from there. We'll iron out the bugs. It, it'll, like the degree of autonomy will be radically better. You'll just literally be able to talk to it and say, please do this task, or I'm going to show you something. Now do that, the thing that I'm showing you and uh, you know, get to the point where it can watch a video of something like a person and then learn just by looking at that video and, and do that task. So really it's gonna be quite something. And, and I'm confident of the prediction that there will be more, like the ratio of humanoid robots to humans will be greater than one to one. So that there'll be you know, more than 10 billion humanoid robots in the world, probably 20 or more. And Tesla is going to be by far the leader in that. You're seeing a lot of robot startups, but I think it's actually very challenging to to do Optimus as a robot startup because what we found to make Optimus work, we've had to design from first principles, from scratch, every part of the robot. So the motor, the gearbox, the sensors, power electronics, the communication system, everything had to be done from scratch. We, we found that there's basically nothing. There's no supply chain. Even though there are many electric motors made in the world, there's no supply chain for the types of motors and sensors and gearboxes that are needed for a humanoid robot. And you, I mean, what you're seeing here is our current generation uh, hand and arm, but our next gen which has 11 degrees of freedom, our next generation has 22 degrees of freedom. It will be able to play the piano. So it's, it's really like, wow. Now, of course, like I said, we need to make sure we don't have the Terminator scenario. That's very important. You know, sa safety of the humanoid robot will be very important. But because it requires so much ground-up design, designing every motor, gearbox, sensor, power electronics from scratch, it's, it's very hard for a startup to, if not impossible, for a startup to replicate that. But at Tesla, we have the world's best electrical engineering. I think we've got the world's best mechanical engineering for, for gearboxes and, and for uh, you know, electric motors, power electronics. You know, we have the resources to do that. It, it, it applies quite well. Uh, and then you also have to have the the brain. You need the, the you need the, the the you need a power efficient inference computer, which we've got for the car, and we'll be using an Optimus. You need to be the best in real world AI, and Tesla's the best in real world AI. You need a very strong hand of cards in order to make a compelling uh, robot. And then you also need to be very good at scale manufacturing. So in order to have the robot not cost like hundreds of thousands of dollars, in order to make it cost like ten or twenty thousand dollars actually need to design for manufacturing and be very good at manufacturing. What in my experience, prototypes are, are easy compared to volume manufacturing. 
Prototypes are easy, production is hard, um, relatively speaking. So Tesla has the production capability, it has the engineering capability, and it has the AI hardware and software capability. Even the most optimistic estimates that I've seen for, for Optimus, <laughs> the Optimus optimist, I think undercount the magnitude of, of what this robot will be able to do. You know, as I said at the beginning of the, of the presentation, I, you know, I agree with the ARK Invest analysis that autonomous transport is called sort of a five to seven trillion dollar market cap situation. Optimus, I think, is, is a, a 25, a, literally 25 trillion dollar market cap situation. So. I don't want to trivialize what's necessary to get there. I mean, it's an immense amount of work that is required to get there, like super difficult. But uh, we are moving very fast down that road, and we're going to make it happen. Thank you.